I would have said that I first started to understand the seriousness of the climate emergency probably about four years ago. <clears throat> so I don't consider myself to be any sort of climate expert. I spent 30 years uh, in various financial services uh, companies like HSBC and Lloyds Bank. Um, and up until January of this year, I was working for NEST, the uh, government-sponsored workplace pension scheme. Uh, when I decided that I felt the emergency was so great, uh, designing financial products for people to save for the next 30 or 40 years was not actually a, a, a useful uh, way of spending my energy. So I've resigned from my job, in part because of the climate emergency. I think it's that serious. Um, so thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm sharing the talk today, which comes in two parts, with Dan, Dan Carpenter. So Dan, would you like to introduce yeah. yourself, please? Hi, um, I'm Dan, uh, I'm a musician. Uh, when I'm a musician, I'm Dan Spanner. And when I'm a music teacher, which is my main day job, I'm uh, Mr. Carpenter. So I've got two names to sort of help separate things. Um, I taught at Brentfield Primary School um, for many, many years, for like 15 years, um, and uh, also the big band that I uh, play in started here. We, our first gig was in this very uh, complex, so it's quite nice to be uh, to be back in Wilson. Um, uh, I heard about Extinction Rebellion when I was uh, researching um, the the news. Uh, on a Wednesday, I do a big band gig, um, and I take a news item to bring to the performance to sort of make fun of the current current affairs, uh, to make fun of the politicians and so on. And this particular Wednesday, when it was all Brexit, all Brexit, 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 all the sort of rubbish that goes on with Trump and all the other big, big news, there was a, a news item and it was some uh, activists being arrested outside Downing Street. Um, and I couldn't work out, I said, but hang on a minute, that's not in the news, I don't know about this. Um, uh, and I realised they were Extinction Rebellion and uh, they were chaining themselves to the railings and they were talking about this climate emergency <laughs> that we have. Um, and uh, so I explored them a little bit further and went to their march that was uh, to close down the bridges. Um, and uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about it in the second half, but uh, that's what sw switched me into uh, this movement, Extinction Rebellion. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we carry on with a little bit of the introductions, if, if, if we can. So having introduced myself and Dan introducing himself, um, it would be great if we could just spend a minute or two to just uh, look at each other a little bit. Preferably somebody you didn't know before you came today. And just to sort of talk, uh, probably about half a minute, a minute each, to just sort of say what brings you here today. So. If we can do that, um, that, would, that would be great. So please look around and uh, find somebody you don't know and say what brings you here today. It shows something that I felt personally, that people want to talk. And there's too many situations we find ourselves, in my case at work, where you, f you almost feel like the people around you don't know what you want to know. And you, you want to tell them and you want to talk about it. And that is one of the great things I've found about being a member of Extinction Rebellion. So I'm hoping that if you've met for the first time this afternoon, this won't be, this won't be the last time you meet. That, that somehow this will be the start of the journey going forward together. So it's great to hear all these conversations and hopefully at the end we can continue with those conversations. So the first thing, the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, what is Extinction Rebellion and, and who are this, who is this, this group called um, Rising Up. Well, Extinction Rebellion has its origins in an organization called Rising Up. Rising Up was a, a group, it was set up by a group of uh, activists about two years ago, uh, 2016. And one of their first actions was to partly close Heathrow Airport. And they have origins in activism going back longer than that. So there's some of the founders of Rouse, Rising Up and and the founders of Extinction Rebellion have, have clearly had decades of activism. Um, but they built a core team, 
And having learned um, from some successes and some mistakes as well, um, they made the decision in the autumn of last year to start a rebellion. And uh, Dan has mentioned how he first heard about Extinction Rebellion. I heard about it for the first time on the 16th of October from an article written in The Guardian by George Monbiot. So he was talking about this lack of action and why he felt the rebellion was the only way forward. And he was at this, um, I, I didn't make the, the, the launch event, which was the 31st of October uh, in Parliament Square, uh, but he was certainly there and a number of other people. And there were some, some quite significant uh, people in our society, ex-Archbishops of Canterbury, etc., etc., who have written a letter of support about what Extinction Rebellion are attempting to do. So Extinction Rebellion has its own aims and demands, but it's underpinned by the principles and values of Rising Up and some of their strategies and infrastructure. And we're going to cover that in the second part of the talk, which Dan will take us through. So, the talk is in two parts. I'll deliver part A, or part one. Why are we heading for extinction? Um, I'm not going to apologise for some of the quite scary and worrying messages in the first part of this presentation. Um, one of the frustrations I felt over the last four years of reading a lot about this is the piecemeal approach for information to get to the population of this country and populations around the world. I mean, the mainstream media, we, we only saw this week with the beautiful weather, the very hot, unseasonal temperatures in February, and the BBC were talking about ice creams and sitting on beaches in shirt sleeves, right? There's no you know, there's almost this schizophrenic type tendency that you will see these quite terrible news stories of a, the latest scientific, scientific paper in the press, but then you turn, you turn the newspaper and, the, and their easy jet are offering 10,000 flights for 25 pounds. So there is this schizophrenic tendency in the mainstream media that I just feel the message doesn't get, get through. But in the first part of this talk today, it's Extinction Rebellion's um, intention to tell you the truth. And it's one of the demands of Extinction Rebellion that our population, the British population, are told the truth by our government. Okay. So I think something I would like you to keep in mind throughout this talk is something called the precautionary principle. So we can read it. When an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should, not, should be taken, even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. Now that definition comes from what was called the Wind Spread Conference in 1998. That was an academic conference of American, Canadian, and European scientists and um, politicians. So even if we don't fully understand something, as long as there is plausible evidence confirming that something bad is happening, and as long as the consequences should be ter could be terrible, it should be avoided by all means. The precautionary principle has been enshrined in parts of EU law already, particularly in relation to the environment and diet and human health. Um, and, and it can be summed up with a couple of very well-known phrases in, in, in English, although the original precautionary principle came from the German word. But look before you leap. Better safe than sorry. In essence, that's what the precautionary principle is about. And in the first part of this talk, um, I hope to show how we completely neglect the precautionary principle when it comes to environmental change. So let's first go into climate change, the environmental change that is most threatening to humans. This is the IPCC. I don't know if everybody's 
the herd of the IPCC. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, set up by the United Nations um, back in 1988, so 30 years ago now. They produce, uh, they do a lot of reports. They are considered as being the definitive um, authority when it comes to climate change and science and essentially what policymakers should be doing. They produced five assessment reports, the first one in 1990 and then once every five or six years since then. Their fifth assessment report, um, which they produced in 2015, helped to inform what, what is known as the Paris Agreements. In late 2015 in Paris, the governments for the first time signed up to actually start to do something about reducing their consumption and their use of fossil fuels. But one thing I found out by, by uh, just researching for, for this speech, in that fifth <coughs> assessment report, the IPC said, without new policies, the world is heading for 3.7 to 4.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times. So that's pretty sobering. You know, they, 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 you know they, they're quite scary in themselves. So the debate around climate change is heavily dominated and influenced by the IPCC. But nevertheless, there is sufficient dissent among scientists as to why the IPCC, however scary their reports, are not scary enough. The first thing is, they produce reports based on scientific evidence and reports and findings. But of course, this whole process takes five or six years. So they are, when they, when they produce their report, the latest report or the latest assessment they report, they produced in 2015, they're using science that's dated back in 2010, 2011, 2012. So there's a lag effect. The second thing is, um, there are communication problems. I think scientists would admit themselves that when they communicate, they don't communicate in very explicit terms. They talk about, we think this is likely to happen to a 75 to 80% probability. And we think this is going to happen to a 90, 95% probability. That sort of language, if you were speaking in the high street to people about that, would make it sound like you don't know what's going on. That is absolutely typical of scientists. Scientists are very, very reluctant to turn around and say it's absolutely 100% absurd. That's just not the way science works. So they talk in language that makes it feel like they may be uncertain. There's another point about the IPCC. The reports that they produce are the output of a number of working groups. Working group one are scientists. These are people in white coats that measure things and report what they find. Absolutely science. But there's a working group two and there's a working group three. The working group three is when you get to economists and politicians, and they are the ones that help to write the reports that tell policy makers, politicians, what they need to do with this report. So effectively, the lines between science and politics and economics get blurred, and that tends to sort of water down the message. You know, the summary for policymakers is voted on by diplomats, not scientists. And of course, any report that you get, and it's an amazing achievement of the IPCC, to get virtually every country in the world to sign up to an assessment report. Every, if every country in the world is signing up to that report, there's a certain 
watering down of the message. It's not as scary as it could be because, of course, it has to achieve consensus. So there are people who will say there is a systematic tendency of the IPCC to be too conservative in its estimates. The final criticism of the IPCC is they, oh, it's not the final one, it's the final one I'm going to mention this afternoon, is that um, they are basically using something called negative emission um, technologies to, to effectively explain to the world what policymakers can achieve. They are assuming that there are technologies, and I'll go into that probably a, a, in, a little, in a little while in terms of the, um, in some of my later slides. So, okay, I've mentioned a few of the criticisms. Let me give you one example of a really concrete example of how I, the IPCC have not been as urgent or as serious in their predictions because of some of the reasons I've just gone into. This is quite a messy graph, and I don't really want to bombard you with lots of numbers and, and science, but effectively these colored lines are the, uh, it's, it's quite an old graph, so I think the graph dates back to 2012. But the colored lines here are attempt to say what the IPC climate models are predicting for the minimum level of Arctic sea ice in the Northern Hemisphere summer. So around August, September of each year, the Arctic ice thaws before it starts to grow again when, when it gets cold again during the winter. The red line is something called RCP. Uh, RCP 8 or 8.5. I mean, effectively, the RCP stands for Representative Concentration Pathway. It's science job, and you don't need to understand it. But let me just tell you what the red line means. The red line means we don't ever attempt to cut our carbon emissions. We continue to burn fossil fuels right until the end of this century. The green line is assuming that our use of fossil fuels has pretty much peaked in the decade 2010 to 2020, so we're almost at the end of that. So this green line is effectively saying, we only go down from now, we only start using less fossil fuels now into the future than we have previously. And these are the predictions for where sea ice would be, but the problem is the black line is actually what we've seen. So effectively, the minimum level of Arctic sea ice is basically 20 years ahead of schedule, according to the IPCC. So, it's findings like these that have made experts become increasingly pessimistic about the state of play. Now, I want to give you a quote from Professor Shelm Huber, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Now, he's a scientist who's been head of something called the Potsdam Institute um, for 20 years. He's a senior advisor to Pope Francis. He also advises uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the EU. And he says climate change is now reaching the end game. The issue is the very survival of our civilization. Now, only a few years ago, statements like that were not being made. So what is happening, and why is it so very bad? So, we are now about 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And again, I was reading about this in the last few days. 1.1 degree above pre-industrial levels is actually the IPC saying that, that the average temperature across the globe has risen by 1.1 degree since 1850 to 1900. Now, I don't know if we have any historians in the, in the room, but I think the Industrial Revolution started a little bit earlier than 1850. So already 
there's a problem. When, you know, what was our base level? Where did we start? Uh, because it risen about one degree. So people are already sort of rounding it down to, 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 from 1.1 degree. So before we talk about expected temperature increases, it's important to note that certain temperature increases are already locked in. And let me give you an example. Why am I showing a few cars with a load of fumes coming out of the back? Well, when we burn fossil fuels, they actually produce air pollution, particles, aerosols, they're called. And these aerosols go up into the atmosphere and they actually act, act as a bit of a canopy. Okay? And that canopy protects the Earth from some of the sunlight coming through. So when we start to cut fossil fuel use, we have to accept that that pollution is going to dissipate and hence more of the sun's rays are going to get through. So what might that mean for future temperature rise? Well, the IPCC don't actually put a number on it. They refer to a couple of papers, but they don't actually put um, in their report how much, if that pollution was to dissipate, how much could temperatures rise from nothing other than the air pollution dissipating from our atmosphere? Okay, they referred to a number of reports, so let's go into those reports and see what they say. Those reports are effectively saying that there is the possibility of an additional warming of 0.26 degrees Celsius once the pollution dissipates. And there was an article recently published in the Nature magazine, which is one of the most prestigious scientific journals, to say that aerosols may have cooled the planet by as much as 0.7 degrees C. So if we were to stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow, it's possible that the temperature of our planet will continue to rise when this pollution dissipates. It's not an option not to stop burning, but, but effectively we have to realize that this is it's like an oil tanker and it will continue, the temperatures will continue to rise. So you, are, you can argue that the elimination of air pollution is a one-off event. It leads to a sudden increase in temperatures, but then it's done. However, there are several reasons why a sudden increase in temperatures can have catastrophic consequences. And let me give you um, a couple of examples. The first example is something called the albedo effect. I don't know if you've heard of it, but on a hot summer's day, why are you more likely to wear a white t-shirt than a dark t-shirt? Light colours, the white snow, will effectively reflect back out to space some of the sun's rays. So that's about 50% of the sun's rays. If they hit white snow on a glacier in the, in the North Pole, there, those rays will get reflected out into space. But as the planet warms, the sea ice melts, the glaciers melt, and less of those sun's rays are reflected out into space. What replaces the, the, the ice is this dark blue sea. And, and effectively what's happening here is less and less sunlight is reflected, more of the darker seawater below emerges and it absorbs the warmth of the sun's rays. So the warming accelerates. It's a vicious circle. That's called a feedback loop to climb. Uh, climate scientists, and it's not a good thing. A second example is the Amazon rainforest. Now, this is not entirely climate, it's, part, it's partly um, ecological as well, but effectively, at this moment in time, the Amazon rainforest is something called a carbon sink. Trees absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But the problem is, as governments, as the Brazilian government, might start to destroy some of that forest, and we think we've lost about 20% of the Amazon rainforest 
already, with another 20% of the original area um, also being affected. The danger is, is something called another feedback loop starts to take hold. So what's going on? The Amazon, uh, and this, this comes from a report called The Future Climate of Amazonia, which, which was written in 2014. So it, it confirms that the Amazon is one of the greatest carbon sinks on the planet, consuming large amounts of CO2. And Amazon trees transfer large volumes of water from the soil into the atmosphere, which causes, causes rain. As deforestation of the Amazon takes place, there's a decrease in this transpiration um, from the soil to the air. And that results in less rain. Less rain results in less growth, an extended duration of dry season, and hence an increase in forest fires. And when we get forest fires, there is a rapid transfer of carbon, which is embedded in these trees, back up into the atmosphere. So it suddenly goes from being a carbon sink, which is incredibly good in our, in our attempts to mitigate climate change, to suddenly being a, a, a source of carbon, which is incredibly bad. And we are, we are starting to get worried now that the Amazon rainforest is at a tipping point. Um, if we choose to carry on with business as usual, especially if we opt not to repair the damage inflicted on the forest so far, then it, it, it could suggest that we might be 20, 40 years away from that tipping point in the Amazon rainforest. Now the IPCC, the IPCC's models don't assume any tipping points. So the problem that we have about the IPCC, there's another problem we have about the IPCC, their report suggests this linear relationship. The more carbon we burn, the more the temperature increases. But it's almost like a straight line. Whereas we're worried about these tipping points, that somehow it starts to cascade. <clears throat> there was a paper that came out um, last year that actually goes a step further and it starts to suggest that as individual tipping points start to be triggered and it's very difficult to know when you've reached a tipping point. You normally only know you've reached a tipping point after you've reached it. So we, we, we're, we're in some sense <coughs> playing Rus Russian roulette to a certain extent. But this paper um, had a long title, Trajectories of the Earth System in the An Anthropocene, it was published last year, and it basically started to talk about the Anthropocene as a new epoch, a new period of time. We've been in something called the Holocene, which is the 10,000 years since the end of the last ice age. Relatively stable temperatures that have allowed humans to um, uh, grow uh, as a species on the planet and, and lots of animals. But the scientists are now saying that the impact of humans on the, the planetary processes are now so great, and have probably been that case for the last 50 years, that we should now forget we're in the Holocene, we should be in something called the Anth Anthropocene. And, and the scary thing about this paper was that essentially these tipping points and the different colours are supposed to represent at what temperature rise these tipping points are expected to be triggered, although we don't really know, they could start to produce a domino effect, a cascade of effect. The world's governments have signed up to limiting temperature rise to no more than 2 degrees C. Actually, they've said no more than 2 degrees C, but actually they want to limit it to much lower than 2, two degrees C. The IPCC came out with a report um, in October last year of what would it take to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degrees C. And um, essentially, this paper that came out at the same time was essentially saying, We've, we've got to be careful. We should really be making lots of effort to try and keep this temperature rise to no more than one, uh, one, 
0.5 degrees C. So it can, it can be a little bit scary. And of course, what, what, do these, what do these cascades, these tipping cascades, start to look like? Well, they start to look like this. In the words of the authors, it's like a ball rolling down the hill, and the, the gradient is getting sleeper, um, faster and faster. So they're, they're worried that essentially, well, let, let, me, let me quote what the words of the authors said uh, about, about this. A critical issue is that if a planetary threshold is crossed towards the hot house Earth pathway, which is what they were talking about, then accessing the stabilized Earth, that's, that's, that's what the IPC are trying to keep us at when well within two, uh, two degrees temperature rise, would become very difficult no matter what actions then humans subsequently took. Beyond the threshold, positive reinforcing feedbacks within the Earth system, outside of human influence or control, could, make, could become the dominant driver of the system's pathway, as individual tipping points create linked cascades through time and rising temperature. I've talked a little bit about client, client, um, climate science now. I now want to talk about ecological overshoot. It's important to remember that the, client, the climate does not operate in, uh, function in isolation of other ecological factors, as we saw in the rainforest example. So, um, Humans already have transformed 51% of the Earth's land cover. They've, made it, they, they, they've transformed it from forest and grassland to crops, cities and grazing lands. <clears throat> Current extinction rates are at least tens and probably hundreds of times greater than background rates and are accompanied by changes that disrupt, that disrupt entire ecosystems on both land and in the sea. This means that the ecological, ecological, ecological changes that uh, humans have caused are even greater than, their, than the changes of the climate. So the biggest factor driving these changes is ecological overshoot. Now what does this graph show? This graph shows how much of the Earth's resources we are currently using uh, on a global basis. So back in 1970, um, we, were, we were broadly, um, we were broadly uh, using, we were sustainably using the Earth's resources. But what this graph says is, as the years have passed, each day of the year gets earlier and earlier in the year when we've used one one planet's worth of global resources, okay? So now we're saying in August, on the August the 1st in 2018, that was the date into the year that the Earth used all the sustainable resources that the Earth had to offer. So that means we're using 1.7 Earths, okay? Now, it is actually, um, it is actually different for individual countries. You can look at um, ecological overshoot on a country by country basis. So um, Vietnam, for example, uh, uses its budget up on the 21st of December in the year. So, so basically they're operating within, within their sustainable resources. Qatar uses it up on the 9th of February. Uh, the UK, out of interest, uses it up on the 8th of May. So it feels like we're using about three Earths in the UK, or our, at least our proportion. Um, we're, we're operating much, much more or we're in a very unsustainable way. So our excessive use of natural resources brings um, several problems. This is a nice, nice picture of Lincolnshire. It means that more and more of the Earth's land cover needs to be transformed 
for agriculture, livestock, forestry, mining, exploration and for other, uh, other materials. So this reduces the very assets that protect us from climate change. It also means we're using our assets in an unsustainable way. Let me give you some examples. Michael Gove, the Environmental Secretary, has warned that the UK is 30 to 40 years away from the fundamental eradication of soil fertility. Once it's gone, it's gone. That's how we grow our plants and our crops. Many other countries have reached that point. This is even worsened by climate change, which caused drought. As an, uh, as an ex, as, a, as an anti-war activist first, you know, I've watched what's happened in countries like Syria. Did you know that Syria had a climate change element to its internal civil war? Between 2006 and 2011, 60% of Syria had its worst long-term long -term drought and crop failures in thousands of years. And that's been a civilization that's been around since way before our own, our own country. This put two to three million people into poverty and amplified some of the uh, political factors that led to